as my indicated, uh, I'm the environmental guy. I'm not a nuclear expert. So if you ask uh, any detailed questions, I'll just have to refer you to somebody, and, uh, and, and I'll try to get you the, the answers. But um, if you talk to a whole bunch of people, in fact, a lot of in this room, they'll tell you I'm not an expert in anything. So, uh, but I try, and I, I know a little bit about a lot. Um, I plan to talk a little bit broader than nuclear, so that's why I volunteered to go first. And, uh, and I, um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about electric generation, emissions, and um, what our options are to address these issues. Um, some of my slides, in fact, many of my slides, I shamelessly uh, took from Electric Power Research Institute and the Nuclear Energy Institute. And uh, you know, Adam's here, and uh, he, he indicated that was okay because I paid for at least some of the month from the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, so, because we are very involved with, with their, their activities, and they've done some great work. There's even better work coming uh, in the next wave. Um, but anyway, um, I'll, I will get, I promise I will get into nuclear a little bit and what we're doing as a company. I guess before I get started, though, I, I really am ticked off today. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the, the activity in Washington is just unbelievable to me. Um, you know, you heard a little bit earlier that uh, uh, Cary Graham Lieberman got sidetracked. And, uh, it, you know, there's really no excuse for this other than pure, unadulterated uh, politics. Uh, they decided that... Uh, They've done a whole lot of work on climate, uh, those three senators especially, and working with the environmental community, industry, and trying to work out a beginnings of a deal. And uh, now they're going to go off and claim that they're going to go work on immigration. And if anybody understands what's done on it, been done on immigration, you know, the Bush administration worked on it for three years and had a hard time getting anything done. There's no way in the world in this year in an election year with the few days that are left that anything will occur there. So I, you know, it's uh, anybody who would rather work on this issue than come to conferences and talk about it should be ticked off today. I mean, that's just, uh, uh, it's just pure politics of taking over. Um, so I, being an environmental guy, not a politician, I can get upset about those things. But, uh, um, the, uh, I think this is going to be tough. Can I look at the thing and, or, uh, um, <laughs> go ahead, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I usually start off most of my uh, talks with, with a slide like this. And electric generation is tied to economic development, or energy is tied to economic development. And electric generation is tied to economic development. Um, used to be, you know, pure energy use was ran right with it. Uh, then as we started to electrify things, it started to split off a little bit. As we get more and more efficient, it split off a little bit further. But clearly, energy use and electricity um, use is, is tied to economic development. We all want economic development. You know, th these are 2006 slides, so... Uh, Things have changed a little bit, but not much. Uh, this is still the way things are set up. And, and I put this first slide on always to, to remind people how difficult, and Steve was talking to me earlier about how difficult it is in a uh, report that he has to actually get, we're talking 80% reduction. If you talk to, you know, the, this chart on the, the right, um, or uh, your left, um, the, you know, electricity, uh, generation accounts for about 33 percent, about a third of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And transportation, I, I always call it another third, a little bit less than a third. You know, industries, good chunk, and then everybody else is in there uh, for about 20 percent. So if you're talking about an 80 percent reduction, which is what the goal is, that everybody talks about, you know, you practically have to take the electricity generation to zero. Um, 
you know, and you got to feed the transportation sector or much of the industrial sector, get as much efficiency you can and everything else uh, to get there. So this is, you know, that's why we aren't, we haven't solved it yet. Uh, this is not an easy thing to do. And if you look at the, if you go on to the electricity uh, sector, about half of our electricity is generated from coal. And that's a significant contributor to greenhouse gas. About 20% from natural gas. That's less, but still a significant contributor to the greenhouse gas. And nuclear is about 20%. <clears throat> so remember this slide, because when I go to the future, uh, we'll kind of uh, think back to this one. Okay. So what are our options for new generation as we, we try to plan for? This is an electric power research uh, institute report slide. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about nuclear. So you can see you know, nuclear is right there at the low end. This is uh, cost per uh, metric ton, dollar per metric ton of CO2 along the bottom axis. And levelized cost of electricity <coughs> along the, the Y axis. And so, you know, pulverized coal, you know, as, electric, or as carbon starts to get out there near 20 bucks, it starts to get a little bit shaky. Uh, pulverized coal, you know, with or IGCC, uh, if you can get carbon capture and storage, you might be able to get things. You got wind at 32% capacity factor, which is probably about what best we can do here in Michigan. Um, you know, that, right now, the, now, you know, there, there may be things, breakthroughs that occur, and we may be able to uh, reduce costs, but uh, right now, you know, those are your options. And you know, natural gas with combined cycle, it's it's not bad um, at eight dollars a million BTU. Right now, it's sort of like four dollars a million BTU. So if you were deciding right today, you could get a long-term contract for natural gas, which I don't know if there's anybody out there offering yet. Um, you know, that that would be what you would do, uh, at least for the short term. Um, and if it, you know, it's, if it's $10 a million BTU, and we all remember it was only a couple years ago we were as high as $14, $16 a million BTU. Now that was a spike and didn't stay there, but, uh, and people, you know, my gas guys, we have, we have a gas company too, uh, Michigan, Michigan Consolidated Gas, they tell me this time around there's an abundance of gas, and, you know, and that, that's the way to go. But, uh, you know, I said, you know, I remember whenever it was illegal to generate electricity with natural gas in the 80s because um, we built an oil plant. Um, and, uh, and I remember then in the 90s it got cheap and everybody went out and built them. And then we spiked again at, you know, whatever, $14, $16 a million BTU. So when, when you look at this and you look long term, nuclear seems to be uh, a real good option. Um, Going forward. So, um, here we get into the Electric Power Research Institute Prism Merge model. And um, let's see, there's a slide. Well, this black line is basically, this is about a 42%, 41% reduction in CO2 emissions, which is what the goal is for about 2030. 80% by 2050, about 40% reduction by 2030. So if you look at this, it's possible uh, if you do everything, and and I mean everything. You know, the efficiency's got to be in there, and this is with the uh, I think 2009 EIA estimate, which already puts a whole lot more efficiency in than than other years. And so, but even more efficiency. Renewables is a big chunk in there. You got to start doing some more with nuclear. Uh, you got to have some coal with carbon capture and storage. Um, you know, we we put in the uh, um, you know electric electric vehicles, uh, plug-in electric hybrids, and because uh, we like to take credit for that, it could be in the transportation sector, but uh, but we're, we'll supply the power for them. Um, but you know, it is possible to get to an 80% reduction if you do everything. And that's why I want to start a little bit broader than just talk about nuclear, because you really have to do everything. And uh, so, okay. Um, so on the, um, 
and there there was another one apparently didn't make it. But uh, um, that uh, that's okay. Um, that talks about you know what you have to achieve in each one of those those areas. Uh, and if you see, you know, we don't get a whole lot of solar in these because right now at least solar is pretty expensive um, on a you know delivering per megawatt hour. Um, so, in addition, EPRI went through, in addition to the PRISM technology, which is kind of capabilities uh, evaluation, they looked at it and they looked at their merge model, it starts to get into the financing. And really kind of looked at two scenarios. One was a limited portfolio where basically the, the limitations are uh, you don't get to do carbon capture and storage because either the policy gets in the way or you know, you, whenever you start doing testing, it doesn't really uh, deliver. You don't make the public confident that you can use it. I think you should be able to. But, uh, and you don't do much in the way of nuclear. Again, probably because of policy. Um, so, uh, so those are two that, uh, that you know, you, for the limited portfolio, you just have your existing levels of production on nuclear and um, and on carbon capture and storage, it's unavailable. Plug-in electric, it also has plug-in electrics are unavailable. So, go ahead. So this is what your generation mix kind of looks like um, the, on those limited or... Uh, one there quick question. Sure. When you say nuclear, are you say, saying second gen, or are you saying second, third, fourth gen, kind of all mixed together? Um, Do say, with it. Um, I don't know if you can... Right. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you. The the question was is that you know nuclear uh, as we generate it as we uh, as our plants are now as the next wave of, of nuclear plants are which are much more standardized and uh, I guess the the big uh, change is all the protections are basically gravity uh, type. Operations, so you don't have to power things to, to shut things down. Um, and then, you know, waves beyond that is to do it even better. Um, these real small ones that you can build anywhere. Um, uh, but this is probably the second generation uh, going forward, the, you know, the one that's coming now. Um, and you see, if you're in a limited portfolio, um, you get a lot more demand reduction, um, which, when we look at this, this is a, we think this is more than much more than efficiency improvements. This is really you're doing. There are things that you would like to do that you're not doing now because of the cost. Um, you have a little bit of solar in there because it plays in because the cost is pretty high. Um, you get a lot of gas. Um, not much nuclear, in fact, less than you have now as you retire things. Uh, coal pretty much goes away pretty quick. Um, and um, so, so that's a difference in scenario. The, you get more nuclear, you get uh, coal with carbon capture and storage comes in here uh, in the full portfolio. So, yes? Did you limit the lifeline of coal for what reason? Well, because the, it doesn't come in because of the cost. So as the price of carbon keeps going up, remember that first chart. Right. Okay. Um, you know, this carbon gets to whatever hundred dollars a ton. Um, the car, the coal keeps going away. You replace it with a lot of gas because gas gives you about half the uh, carbon emissions as as coal does. Um, so that's uh, that's basically. So if you do have those two portfolios, if you have a full portfolio, we're talking by 2050, about an 80% increase in the cost of um, electricity. Um, when you think about that, between now and 2050, 80% sounds like a lot, but that's not a terrible uh, thing. You know, I mean, everything increases in, in cost. So uh, that's probably not a terrible thing. Uh, but a 210 percent increase in that time. If you have the choice, which one are you going to take? 
So, uh, good. And, and this is kind of the mix that you get under those scenarios. Um, this is uh, by 2030, and the next slide is by 2050. Um, but you see, uh, you know, you get, you're, you have a lot of coal uh, bonus with carbon capture and storage. You get more nuclear, and if you remember back uh, from the chart that we're starting with today, um, you know, you still get a lot of wind uh, in either scenario. You get less gas on the, um, the full portfolio, a lot more gas if you, um, if you can't do nuclear or you can't do carbon capture and storage. Um, but those are the two scenarios that you end up with. Uh, you can tell these slides are good. Yes? Uh, on the previous uh, screen, you had solar disappearing, it, it appears. And it, you're not looking for any more efficiencies, or I mean, the cost just completely makes solar uncompetitive. Is that in the full yeah. portfolio? In the full portfolio right now, um, you know, based on where EPRI sees things in going in this time frame, you don't get enough of a breakthrough in solar to really make it economical. I'm sure it's in there somewhere, it's just smaller, I don't know, Adam, if you're... The big difference between the two is in the limited portfolio. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm with the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, the big difference between the limited and the, and the full is in the limited portfolio, the price of carbon goes to like $250 an ounce, and that can drive tremendous you know, advances, and you can definitely put it in solar at $250 a ton of CO2. In the full portfolio, you have a whole slew of technologies that come in much more cost effectively. So it's not like you're not trying to do solar in the full, so you just don't do it. It's not cost effective, $100 a ton, $50 a ton, whatever the price point is in a particular year in the full portfolio. The full portfolio is based on having a set of technologies that are available through research and development. The limited is not having those technologies. That includes concentrated solar. Oh, yeah. Could you add a few sentences about what's driving the, what your assumptions are about what's driving the cost of coal up? Is it the, strictly the carbon tax? Oh, so that's the, well, you have two things going on. You have the price of carbon rising, which makes every ton of uh, CO2 emitted cost quite a bit. And over time, that moves coal out of the dispatch with gas and, and the operating dispatch of regional power grids. But as those plants become less economic, they get retired and they get replaced by whichever portfolio world view you think we'll have in you know, 20, 30, So it's based on the carbon, the cost of carbon, not the dimension oh, of the supply of coal available. Right. 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 Why not? Because I, we can have a whole discussion about coal, maybe. Kind of yeah, I, I, it, well, I guess the, the assumption is that we have enough coal, just like the assumption is that we have enough gas. The World Coal Institute says we have 120 years of coal left worldwide at current rates, you're projecting huge increases in electrical generation from coal, so it will be a lot less than 120 years. Why is it that going to affect the cost? Well, two things just to throw in here. One, there are no large increases in coal production, right? Coal currently makes up half that pie. This is U.S., but we're talking more. We're talking U.S., coal makes up half the pie. Right? Okay, this I'm going to sort of... Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> We'll try to get some more questions later, but that's good. What's the total, just real quick, what's the total increase in use in, in these models? Like how much more are we producing overall? Um, I don't recall. It's the EIA um, projection. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. It's the Department of Energy's Energy Information uh, Administration. Administration, right. So, um, it's whatever they're projecting. That includes plug-in hybrids. Right. Yep. And and it's the latest one that's, like I said, much more efficient. Every every year we've got. If you look at 2006, it gets real. Uh, we didn't think we were going to do anything efficient so far. Right. We can gain. <coughs> so okay. okay. All right. So nuclear, and you can get the next one too. Because I think there's one. Oh. Maybe try one more. No. They don't, they don't both come in? Oh, okay, never mind. Um, but 
the, if you go back, the, the last slide, uh, right now we have, about, we have 104 nuclear plants in this country. Um, there's only uh, a couple that are in the process of being permitted. Um, and, um, you know, but worldwide, we have, I mean, there's 400 now, there's 50 new, it's under construction. So, you know, some people say we can't do nuclear because that leads to nuclear proliferation and, and that. I had that discussion with uh, Senator, or Congressman Ehlers, and, and the, his comment to me was, look, the rest of the world's building nuclear plants. He says, we aren't going to stop that. So uh, us not doing it isn't going to stop that issue. Uh, and there are a lot of things you can do to protect against it. And you got 130 plants on the order, 300 are being considered worldwide. So, yeah. so it's pretty safe. Uh, if you look at, you know, nobody's, the, the injury rates are, uh, of nuclear power plants are very good. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and, you know, even go back, I you know, I, one of my first projects was uh, writing a testimony for the Public Service Commission for my boss when I first started in 1978, uh, saying how difficult it was. It was just as difficult to license a coal fire power plant as a nuclear power plant. Fremont Island hit, and uh, threw that in the trash. <laughs> and um, so now we're coming back. So there's a lot of a lot of discussion now, that, you know, and, and, and nobody was hurt in Fremont. I mean, that's the other thing to keep in mind. Um, and so, you know, we, we think it is safe. We'll talk a little bit about the, the waste issue, so okay. It's reliable. This is uh, um, the capacity factor for nuclear plants have been steadily increasing. It's up in the 90% range now. Uh, if you look at this small chart over here, you know, coal is about 70%, combined cycle gas is about 40%. It could probably run a lot more at the price. Uh, there was a price of carbon or something, there would be a lot. The capacity factor for combined cycle gas would be much higher. Wind is about 30%, 31%, uh, which is probably about the best you're going to do, except for some parts of the country. I was just curious, because it looks like over the last dozen years, you have a capacity factor increase by about 20%. And what's been the big change to make that jump? Um, it's been basically smarter operation and you know shorter uh, downtimes for refueling. Uh, it used to take you know, several months, two to three months to do a refueling. Now you're on you know, 20 days. Uh, so so that's those are the kind of gains that's been able to make. Um, it's affordable, at least the plants that we have out there now. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, it costs a lot of money to build new ones. No question about that. Um, but, uh, you know, this green line here is nuclear, and uh, the fuel is pretty cheap. Um, and has been. Now, again, you, know, you build more and more nuclear plants, the price of fuel starts to go up. But the projections are the price nuclear will continue to be much cheaper um, going forward. But you've got to have it for a long time. Okay. Again, affordability, um, base load capital costs, and people will argue what capital cost is. Um, and uh, we haven't built one in a long time, so until we really get into that, um, we can't say positively, but uh, undeniably, they, it is large. Uh, and there's a fair amount of risk if you don't build it. I said, you know, we were building Fermi 2 uh, when Three Mile Island did. It was about 90% finished the day Three Mile Island occurred. The next day, it was 60% finished. So, because we had to redo a whole lot of things. Um, so that's that's the risk. Uh, it's it's a great running plant now, uh, you know, doing a great job for the company. But we wrote off a billion dollars, um, so that you know that's the thing to keep in mind. Yes. What is the uh, time of completion from the time of approval to putting it in commission? 
Well, it's 42 months minimum uh, to license it uh, through the NRC. Uh, that's just that part of the license. You know, we have to get you know, uh, some environmental licenses, permits also. But it's 42 months, and that's if everybody says this is the greatest thing, they're cheering you on, and that doesn't happen. Um, so it'll take longer than 42 months. Um, and then construction's probably five years. So you know, nine years, uh, basically, uh, to build a nuclear plant if, again, everything's going well and somebody's not suing you. Um, so that, those. But you know, these days, you, may, you have the same options no matter what you do. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, people, some people don't want that. So OK. Um, and this is levelized costs. And again, it kind of goes back to that first chart where the, you know, the graph was uh, showing the nuclear on a levelized basis because of the low fuel costs is, uh, is very competitive. I'm trying to flow through these pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, it's source of emission free. Well, we have shareholders. Uh, Matthew Lahart of Mary Sisters are major shareholders in our company, and I talk with them all the time. And uh, they remind me that if nuclear generation overall is not emission free, because you have to mine the, the fuel and all those kind of things. And granted, that's true. So I recognize that all the time right up front. And, uh, but it's much, much lower emissions on an overall basis than, than any possible. Okay. So in general, there's a lot of opportunity for jobs. And you can just go through these ones. Um, you know, it brings money to the, the state and development, just like, just like development of a lot of things. And it operates and provides very good, high-paying jobs. Um, and you know, overall, uh, people are getting much more even remote, much more uh, open to uh, being willing to accept nuclear plants. Uh, this is favorability of nuclear energy, and you see the the graph is uh, getting much better as far as people who favor. Uh, nuclear energy. And the next one is a little, not quite as much. These are people who want to go build one. Um, so it's, uh, uh, you know, people are okay with the ones that are there, but not necessarily as strong and uh, um, willing to go build more. Okay. So this, you can go right through these. This uh, talks about the permitting process. And I think my slides are going to be somewhere that you can yeah. look at, so. Yeah, the will be online. Okay, so, uh, and then this is kind of our, uh, where we're at. Um, we're uh, looking at, at this design, which is a boiler water reactor, and again, it's a, uh, uh, where the safety systems are passive. Uh, so you don't need power. So that's why it, it's even safer than the existing one, which is, again, very safe. So that's. Uh, is there anybody who will still support it? Yeah. Uh, I lived in Maryland most of my adult life next to a uh, nuclear power plant, Calvert Cliffs, which was one of the first to be recommissioned when its first time period ran out. And that's becoming a process around the country. What is the efficiency of those old nuclear power plants? compared to what can be achieved with the new? Um, they're still very efficient. You get a 90% plus capacity factor on existing power plants. They're really well maintained. Um, you know, they're regularly inspected by uh, NRC, other peers in the industry and everything else. So. Um, Lifetime, you know, I mean, these were 20 year licenses that are now being renewed for 40 years, and there's some people talking about 60 years. Uh, on the new ones, you're probably talking 200 years out of them, but we'll see. Um, 
So there's a lot of life left in, in, a, in a nuclear plant, as long as it's well maintained. Um, can you talk to me about the differences? Like, Europe always seems more skeptical and more in favor of being environmentally protective, and I know that they do use a significant chunk of nuclear power. What's the difference between what they do and what we do in the U.S. to have engendered so much trust in their people? Um, well, the French are, are the major users of nuclear power, and they, as a government, they decided they were just going to do it. And um, they recycle their um, fuel, which is a good thing. Um, we made a decision back when Three Mile Island occurred, I think it was purely a political decision, that we weren't going to recycle. Um, and uh, that's caused this uh, nuclear waste issue to be a bigger issue than it would have been. Um, the recycling is on a military base, um, so it's well protected. Um, Talked to some of my my, uh, my nuclear uh, counterparts in the, in the company have been there. And it's, uh, you know, so those those are probably the biggest factors. Um, one of the things that we find is if people are familiar with it, like we get the greatest support of a nuclear power plant down near our nuclear power plant. They've lived with it for 30 years. They get great benefits from it in the you know, good school taxes and, and all that. So the community does well from it. And they're, you know, they're fine with it. And they're happy to have another one. As, as you get away from it, uh, people are less familiar. So I think a lot of it is kind of built on itself. That you know, in France, you know, they've been fine with it. Uh, they're familiar with it. So they're okay with doing more of them. So I think that's fine. All right. All right. Well, I think we can talk about this for a little bit. But adhering to strict principles of equity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.